My name is Deborah Salen. I'm from the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at ASU. Um, and it's great to be here. Uh, so I'm really happy to happy to be here. I'm really interested to, as I've told a few people, I'm really actually to give this presentation. I've I've given it to a couple of audiences of executives. I haven't given this presentation to an audience of you know mixed sides of researchers and, and practitioners. So I'm very interested to hear what you all um, and your reaction with that and what you have to say. So what I'm going to talk about today is location value capture as a way to pay for transit systems. Um, and uh, the, 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 as I you know, hint here in the subtitle, uh, what I'm really going to be talking about is not, it's not like what are location value capture um, mechanisms or how do they work, or are they equitable or whatever, although I'll, I'll, I'll put, give an overview of that in the beginning. But I'm going to talk about how organizational characteristics of transit agencies themselves impact um, the success or failure of implementing location value capture mechanisms. So if I do this, here we go. Um, I'm going to start with a quote. So this is, this is a very old quotation uh, from 1930 from the New York Times. I'm just going to read it because it's so wonderfully written uh, about value capture. So, to place the full burden of rapid transit service on the passenger does not seem just in view of the collateral advantages which flow to neighboring property owners in the form of enhanced land values and to business interests in the public at large by reason of increased prosperity and convenience. An equitable division of the cost of service between the passenger through his fare, the neighboring property owner through assessment, and the businessman and citizen through general taxation should make feasible the expansion of rapid transit facilities without weighing too heavily on any of the interests affected. So this is what people thought about how transit should be um, funded in the, um, uh, in, in the early part of this century. Uh, and just the kind of the bullet point version is they said, okay, we, we need some of the money to come from riders. We need some of the money to come from some version of the general public at large of the state, the province, or the nation. And we need some of the money to come from the general public within the transit service area. And we need some of the money to come from people who are getting value over and above like the user value. Um, from the fact that transit exists. So the property owners that had see their property values rise, the businesses that get more customers, and motorists who are experiencing less traffic congestion on the roads due to the fact that there are a bunch of people you know, not driving. And so what, what we've done in our work is we said, okay, we're going to draw a box around these bottom two um, bullet points and call that location value capture. These are the people that are, um, that are getting kind of direct or indirect benefits from, uh, from, from how transit makes locations better. So to give you an idea of how much money needs to be raised um, or, or, could, or, you know, could, or isn't raised, I guess, uh, from fares, I just have this one table of fare box recovery ratio. So this is how, what percentage of the operating cost, not, not the total cost, but the operating cost, of, um, of transit systems that are uh, paid for by fares. And as you can see, you know, the only one that is more than, more than one, so the only place that pays, the only place on this table anyway, that pays more than their full operating costs with fares is the Mass Transit Railway Corporation in Hong Kong. Uh, and all of the others are, are somewhat less than one or, or very much less than one. You can see I added, I, I put Portland's TriMet here at the bottom and it's about a third of the, um, of the operating costs are, cover, are covered by fares in this city. And so what that means is that, so looking back here, that means the, the bottom three groups need to be paying the rest plus the capital cost of, of, of these systems. So there's been a lot of interest for this reason in, um, in ways that we can get people to, to pony up for transit. And so I just, Cut, you know, some cut and pasted a few recent news pieces. So this is a, a news piece just from I think last spring uh, on how Los Angeles can do a better job of uh, incorporating value capture kind of strategies into its transit funding package. This was written by a couple of faculty on the uh, urban planning faculty at uh, University of Southern California. This is an example from. Um, City Lab, where uh, Eric Jaffe wrote about missed opportunities to pay for New York subway expansions, and those missed, op missed opportunities are related to you know, using value capture to help pay for them. 
Uh, and then I, I, I did notice that here in this city there have been some successful examples of value capture. And so this is one case study that is highlighted often, um, the Cascade Station and the, the red line to the airport was uh, partially paid for through value capture. And you probably know more about that actually than I do, <laughs> that particular case. So on to what we did. What was our study? So a little bit of background for our study is in, in 2012, 2013, and 2014, there were um, a set of events which were called the Trans Transit Leadership Summit. And these events were events where senior executives of major transit agencies um, around the world met to share ideas and experiences behind closed doors where, where the idea was they could be really candid with each other and hopefully exchange some best practices sort of on the down low <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so the first version of this work was actually a commissioned paper for the third of those, of those transit leadership summits. And the idea was they would read this paper as a background paper. I actually did a presentation at the summit in 2014. Um, and it would spark a discussion of you know, real world use of location value capture strategies uh, to, fund, to fund transit. And the, the, the commissioning group had basically three research questions. Uh, the first one was, why aren't we using value capture more often? Why is this not standard, standard practice? It's been known since at least 1930, longer ago than that. It was in a lot of, in, in many ways you can say, value capture was the platform upon which the original transit systems were actually built by private companies. So what happened? Why aren't we doing it anymore? Um, number two, okay, so what are the challenges and opportunities faced by transit agencies that are trying to do it now? And then finally, once we've figured out who's been doing it and how they're doing it, are there any practical lessons that we can learn from these leader agencies so that other agencies can take better advantage of these, um, these kinds of uh, funding mechanism opportunities? And what did we do to try to answer those questions? We did some in-depth case studies. We interviewed key decision makers at each of six major transit agencies in North America and Europe. You might ask, why North America and Europe? Well, the answer was that um, most of the transit agencies at the Transit Leadership Summit were in North America and Europe, although we had a few from Asia as well. Um, but the North American and European um, transit agencies were the ones that were experiencing the most uh, challenge in implementing location value capture strategies. And looking at the Hong Kongs and the Singapores and the Tokyos doesn't necessarily help North American uh, and European transit agencies that much because the institutional context is just so different. So, so we really focused on just North American and European agencies. We, we, we looked at um, the Transport for London, the um, Washington, you know, I'm going to make sure I wrote down what all these names, <laughs> all these acronyms stand for. WMATA, which is the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Um, New York City, it's not, New York City Transit is the New York City. We actually looked at the New York Metropolitan Transit Authority, so the MTA. Um, the SFMTA, San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. STIF, which is a French acronym for the, um, the, the, the funding sort of body for transit in Paris. They actually contract out with private providers, but STIF is the group that, that where, where, the, where the funding starts. That's where the funding is, and then they, they give it out. Um, and then AMT, which is a similar body in Montreal, the, um, which that's where the funding originates. And actually, AMT does operate some of the transit lines, but some they contract out. So there's a, there's a mix there in terms of contracting. But that's not really what we're talking about today. But these, were our, these were our six. Um, case study cities. You'll notice uh, that they're all, these are all big cities with big transit um, systems um, and big rail transit systems as well. And some of these transit systems are like, you know, more than 100 years old. So these are, these are big sort of legacy transit cities, but there's, they're also cities that are all expanding their transit offerings, building new stuff, you know, experiencing maintenance crises, um, and, and etc. So there was there was some diversity, but it doesn't really. Um, you know, these agencies don't represent. Uh, you know, some of the types of, of, of transit situations that, that we see in some of the smaller U.S. cities are the ones that haven't 
uh, implemented transit very in a very big way yet. These are really the big ones. So for the rest of this presentation, here's, here's, here's the plan. Um, first, we're, I'll review what is location value capture really and what are the challenges with it. Um, then I'll tell some stories of location value capture implementation from each of the agencies I just mentioned. Uh, and finally, I'll end with the lessons learned piece, which is that third research question. How can practitioners um, facilitate location-based funding for transit? So the take-home message from, uh, from this first bit, this review of location value capture, is that capturing location value is complicated. It's, um, it's a lot more complicated than fair collection and uh, or than getting subsidies from you know, the state or the nation. Both of those things are complicated enough, right? But value capture uh, funding is, is even, even more complicated. And, and the next few slides will hopefully give you some insight as to why, why that is if you're not already there. Um, so what does the location value depend on? So one thing is uh, if you want to do location value capture, you have to make sure you're actually creating location value. And that, that's, that's one obvious point. That was one reason why we really focused on our case studies were places where I think that it is um, not, a, not, not under debate whether those systems create location value. I think people think these major systems create a lot of location value. And so then we could just move on to thinking about capturing it and how they're doing it. We don't have to worry about whether there is location value being created. Um, but what does it depend on? So it depends on the type of service. Mostly we think about location value being created um, in the case of rail service more than bus, although there's been some work on uh, bus rapid transit and the, and the extent to which that creates location value as a sort of intermediate type of service. Um, the distance between, if we're talking about sort of property-based location value, uh, the distance between where that location is and the transit infrastructure, uh, what kind of use that property has. Obviously, um, it'll be well, maybe not obviously, but I think it's true that there is more value created for commercial properties than, than for, for residential properties. Um, the transit service quality and what other transportation alternatives there are at that, at that location. How much access is really, you know, what increment, how much access, access advantage does the transit really give um, if you've already got five other modes uh, serving that location. So, as I said in the beginning, the, the, the way that we conceptualize location value is a little bit expanded from maybe what you've seen if you've, if you've studied this before, looked in the literature. So a lot of the literature really just focuses on the property value. And we've, we've, looked a, we, we've expanded that definition, so, and usually they call it land value capture. We've changed the, the, the wording a little bit to call it location value capture to emphasize that we're really talking about not just the land value, but other ways that um, ec various economic actors can reap value from the system. So the location of value is sort of a continuum here in terms of um, you know, sort of spatial extent. Um, so there can be the, the service region and the location value capture mechanisms that might be used if you're talking about capturing the sort of overall economic um, prosperity because transit exists in your service region. You can think of an income or payroll-based tax, motorist fees, or even you know local option sales taxes that are in um, in effect in, in many places actually to pay for transit. And then the next level down is the station station district kind of region, so pretty broad area around around the station, uh, which could include um, again sort of more property tax-based stuff. Do you think the property values near the station would go up more, or? or transit-focused development fees, um, tax increment financing, special assessment districts. And then just at the station and adjacent properties, you'll start to see things like joint development, joint development of transit and you know, other retail or, or, or office development or whatever. Or thinking about just even something as relatively simple as leasing commercial space in the stations, um, or development rights or air rights. And I don't know how much that happens in Portland. Maybe we can talk about that later. But in other cities, um, it, does, it does happen uh, a good bit. So that's what we're talking about, is a whole range of stuff. So then there's this question of, so there's a whole range of stuff you can do. Um, 
when, when should you do it? Well, um, so here's some, some guidelines that, that are from the literature about when one might do this. So do it when transit adds clear value, like we said. Um, it's important that you can identify the spatial extent of the benefit zone you're talking about. And this hasn't always been done. You'll see some examples later where this gets a little fuzzy. But this, um, this picture over here is a picture of how London charges for what they call their community infrastructure levy. And that's their zones. And you can see that it goes from like sort of a brighter green in the middle where they're they're charging developers more to develop in, the, in those areas. And then sort of the middle green is the next level of, of charge. And then there's a lighter green area. So they actually have um, you know, different charges for different, different spatial extents, ex essentially. And then this last point, um, which I'll expand on a, a, in a little, bit, a little bit more in one of the later slides, is that people have the ability to pay. And so this is more of an equity question. You know, should we be charging? Uh, poor people to give them a transit line. Well, probably not, right? And so, um, and so that ends up uh, becoming becoming an issue as well because we certainly want to provide transit for poor people. Um, so, then, and then I have this this important note over here: the public sector should not try to capture all of the transit value added because some some money should sh some money should be left on the table to encourage denser development near transit. That's that's one of the big. Um, you know, that, that helps the, the ridership, it helps the transit be more efficient, it, it's just good for everyone. That's the whole point, often, of, of building the transit. All right, just a few other dimensions of value capture. So here are some of the same mechanisms we um, talked about in my continuum of sort of spatial extent of stuff. And then, and then here are a couple of other things you can think about with them. Like who's contributing the money? And when are they contributing the money? So um, the contributors can be property owners, businesses, or developers, so gen generally. And, I, and there's also the motorist group that is not in this, um, in this particular slide. Uh, and the timing can be an ongoing or a one-time fee. So often um, when developers are the target group, they're, they are, um, they're asked to pay only when they do the development. But when it's like businesses or property owners, pretty often it's an ongoing payment where it's an annual tax or fee or, or, or whatever, or even more often than annual. And these all matter for, for um, cash flow, right, for transit agencies. <laughs> and so then, so then there's this question about, so there's all these different mechanisms and they have all these different characteristics. And what are the efficiency properties of all these different mechanisms? Um, and so land value taxes I have up there are theoretically the most efficient in capturing sort of pure location value. If you, you, if you can figure out how to figure out how much, how much land is worth and you could tax just the land, that's ideal. And that's what the economists who originally you know, write about land value capture, that's what they suggest. Very few places have implemented this because it's really hard to figure out how much land is worth independent of what's built on that land, right? There are very few, especially in central cities, you don't see too much land sales, like vacant land. I mean, some, but it's not enough to really usually come up with a, a, a robust estimate of, of the price of that land and how much that price might change, for instance, if you build new infrastructure near it. So it's, it's very difficult to, to, to implement land value taxes. Like I said, they have been done um, a little bit, but, but not, not that often. Uh, and and the, the, the second bullet point is just sort of pointing out that when you capture the value of what's built on the land, that privately created value, then that's inefficient. That's actually um, negatively impacting local economic growth, because you want to be encouraging people to invest in buildings on their land. The, the extent to which you've made a location more valuable should accrue to the land, not the building on the land, right? And so, so, so that's why, that's why it's, it's, it's important to think about that. Um, most places, though, they do just tax the land and the improvement because <laughs> that's easier to figure out what the value is. And so my, my last sort of overview slide, I think this is the last one, on, um, on kind of what are the complications with 
land value capture is this question of equities. Who is providing? So we talked a little bit earlier about you could have the property owners provide, um, con contribute the money. You could have the businesses contribute the money. You could have motorists contribute the money. Um, you could have developers contribute the money. And as you might imagine, policies that ask uh, especially developers and businesses to contribute the money are the most popular because everybody thinks, oh, those are like the big bad guys. They have all this money. We should ask them to contribute. So those tend to be the most um, politically um, viable. And there are real, you know, solid reasons for that. That the, the, if, if the location benefits are tied up in um, value increases in real property like residential um, property values, then the people who happen to own those residential properties aren't actually able to pay anything more unless they sell their property. So it's, it, it's reasonable to think that it's, you don't want to be using just straight up property tax on residential properties um, to do this. But there could be other creative ways to do that. You could say upon sale, right, you have to, you have to pony up some money. Um, so. So yeah, so in summary, it's complicated and usually requires a package, not just one way to capture that value, but a package of taxes and fees levied in an ongoing way, levied in a one-time way on developers, and, 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 and looking at you know, different spatial extents of the benefit zones for different um, users and all of that. So it's, it's complicated. And there are these important pitfalls to avoid. So you want to make sure that you have an equitable outcome, which is generally avoided by the fact that if you try to implement something that's fundamentally inequitable, there's a huge outcry and you can't do it. <laughs> um, but, but the second point is important too. You want to guard against suppressing the local economy. So you don't want to overtax, especially you don't want to overtax improvements on the land. And there's been one, one of our case studies and it has actually been, there's been some discussion about whether they're trying to overtax. That's a, that's a situation in Paris. And I'll talk about it a, a little bit more in a minute, but they're, they're building an enormous new um, rail system. And if you're aware of, of this, like it's like the largest transit investment, I think, ever. And they're planning to pay for a large portion of it through um, taxes on development of new office properties. Well, there's been a bunch of speculation like, well, we're not going to get that development if you tax it that heavily. So there's this question about suppressing local, local economy. We don't want to be doing that. OK, so moving on to the next section. So what about, what about these six cities? What are they, what are they, actually, um, what are they actually doing? So this is just an overview of little Xs. What are they actually doing? Um, they're doing a lot. I mean, you don't need to look at the details. The, the point of this slide is to show you know, most of these cities are doing a lot. Montreal is kind of empty. They're not doing as much there, but they're, they're one of our case study cities because they are planning to do a lot soon, right? So they're, um, they're an interesting case where they're, they're getting ready to do a lot, but they haven't, they haven't done that much yet. Um, but yeah, you can see that most of these places are, are really, there's X's and you know, multiple boxes, which is consistent with what I said here on requiring a package, right, of taxes and fees. The places that are doing it are doing a, a bunch of different things. So how much money is this stuff raising? So here are just some examples of how much money it's raising. Um, in London, the Crossrail project is a, a current project. I think I looked up online before coming here. It's like 75% built or something. Um, it's a very big project. Uh, the, uh, the funds raised through um, location value capture strategies are uh, business taxes and this develop, developer, um, developer tax. And they're raising about a third of the total cost of construction of the Crossrail, which is something like a 22 kilometer like major heavy rail system that's traversing, the London, traversing London underneath the city. So it's a really, really big, expensive uh, new rail project. In Paris, even bigger <laughs> new expensive rail project is happening, uh, the Grand Paris Express. And I think there is more like 200 kilometers of new rail line being built. Um, that can, and the idea there is they want to connect Paris to its suburbs much better. 
Uh, and 80% of the, of the total budget is scheduled to be paid for through location value capture strategy. They have, they have three strategies there. Um, the biggest one, though, is this, off, this tax on new office development. Um, and then there's some smaller projects in, in the U.S. and in, in Washington, D.C. Um, they, they built uh, the, the New York Avenue metro station in D.C., which has actually changed names. Now it's the Noma <laughs> station because the area has become, the particular neighborhood has become more trendy and they changed the name of the station. <laughs> but, but, but they raised, you know, they raised about a quarter of the project cost through location value capture. In that case, it was a, a business levy. And interestingly, in that case and in the one following, in the DC, all of the D.C. cases, in those cases, the local business community actually got together and advocated for doing this because they wanted the, tr the, the transit. So they said, we'll contribute, you know, and here's how we'll contribute. Um, and then in New York, this has been a big, you know, recent case. They just extended uh, one of the major subway lines in Manhattan, the number seven subway line. Um, they added, I think, three extra stations and, um, and they raised most of the money, 98% of the money to build uh, the Subway 7 line extension through uh, lo a location value capture uh, strategy. There's a lot of money, $2.1 billion. So some of these, you know, I guess the point of this slide is to talk about a few real projects and also to say the dollar values are large. They're big, big dollar values in certain cases. Um, here's another slide just saying, well, what percent of the costs are we talking about? Um, quite a bit quite a bit in, in, in a lot of these cities. So London said 10% of total system costs. New York said 10% of total system costs, mostly through not that big example I just gave from the Hudson Yards development project, mostly through a payroll tax that they levy in the region. Um, Paris, similarly, they have a large payroll tax. 40% of their operating costs are, are um, covered through a payroll tax. And in San Francisco, they get a large percentage of their system, of their operating costs through parking fees. So these are big deals. And the places that aren't doing it at all or are doing it just in very small ways, I think the point here is they're really missing out. Um, so New York and Washington, D.C., and the way we categorized, you know, once we did our, our, our research, we kind of categorized our six cities into two groups. One of them is this group, New York and D.C., where they were implementing location value capture without major institutional change, or I'd say without any real institutional change. The other cities, to the extent that they've been able to um, implement large-scale value capture, the way that they've been able to do it, or part of the, part of the way that it's, it's been made possible is through major institutional change. And that's one of our big, big findings. And it really was not expected. We, we did not realize that that, that, that was, was happening before we started this, this work. So anyway, talking about these guys, um, New York and DC, they're two of the nation's strongest transit-enhanced economies and real estate markets. So there's clearly a lot of um, value added from the transit systems. But they both have institutional structures that make location value capture extremely difficult. They have a big jurisdictional boundaries problem. So New York is in what we call the tri-state area. So there are three states involved and multiple cities in the New York area. And Washington, D.C. has essentially the same problem. They have the district, and they have Maryland, and they have Virginia, right? So both of these cases, so coincidentally, it just happens historically, that they have this um, jurisdictional boundaries uh, uh, problem. And the reason that is a big problem is that generally the transit agency doesn't have the authority to directly levy taxes. They have to work with local governments to help them, you know, create those partnerships, levy taxes, and then that money comes back to the transit agencies. That's how you do value capture, like logistically. If you have to work with three states plus a hundred cities to do that, it just is a little too much, right? But if you are sort of more centralized, you have basically one city and maybe a couple suburbs to work with, it works a lot more, a lot more easily. Um, so despite you know, these very serious jurisdictional boundary and, and other challenges, there are a lot of project-based value capture examples, a couple of which I highlighted on the previous slide. But the people we talked to were not at all optimistic about the scope for more. And this was interesting because Going into the project, you know, people kind of, if you look in the literature, you see a lot of 
things written, especially about Washington, D.C. and their amazing joint development program. When I talk to the people who work in the funding department at the, at the, at the Washington Transit Agency, and they said, yeah, but that doesn't contribute, that doesn't, sure, we do that stuff, but it doesn't actually make that much money for it for us. It doesn't solve our budget problem. Um, and we have these serious kind of institutional structural challenges that make it pretty much impossible for us to do much better. And so I just wanted to show you some pictures to, to break up my words. So this is a picture of the Hudson Yards construction uh, in New York. Um, as you can see, they're building some towers. This, this project was actually, they, um, you can see this platform here. They, they actually built a platform over a major rail yard in downtown Manhattan, and they're building, I think it's something like 10 enormous towers on top of that platform. So they created new land, essentially. Uh, and now they're capturing the value from it. So that's how, it, that's how it happened that they were able to raise so much of the money for the rail development from value capture. And they used a TIF kind of structure and they set the baseline value of this land at zero because it wasn't land before they built the platform. And then they're getting all of the property tax revenue from these 10 enormous towers to pay for the bonds that they had to take out to build the subway. <coughs> kind of amazing. Um, so this is the New York Avenue station, now the Noma station in Washington, D.C. It's a photo of what the station looks like with a, with a Washington metro line there. So what happens in these other cities? I talked about institutional change. So in, there are a couple of different ways that institutional change has happened uh, in, in these other places. I, I'd say two big ways. So um, one of them, in, in London and Paris, entirely new regional governments have been created. I mean, this was kind of incredible to us when once we start, started doing this research and figuring out that that's what really enabled um, the kinds of funding strategies they were using in these places, or that was one of the big things. So the Greater London Authority was created in 2000. The, my, my French is not great, but the Société du Grand Paris was created in, in 2010. Um, leaders in Montreal are also seriously considering following this model um, looking to both London and Vancouver, BC was not one of our case cities, but that's another place that came up a lot in the conversations about this because they have apparently done some big institutional changes as well, it leading, you know, resulting in some of the same positive outcomes for value capture. In London and San Francisco, transit agencies were expanded in their authority to become transportation agencies. So essentially, we, they took just sort of your run-of-the-mill transit agency and they said, let's give you new authority over the streets, including parking, tolls, bike ped infrastructure, the whole nine yards. So you're going to be able to now have authority over everything related to transportation in the city and kind of Maybe that seems a little bit obvious, like a good idea, but most places are not structured this way. Um, so, but it allows, in terms of value capture, it allows the, these transit agencies to capture part of the location value uh, of, of the location value of like parking spots and the value created by reduced congestion um, through tolls, congestion pricing, and parking charges. Right? And the Montreal leaders are considering this model as well. So that's why I was saying the Montreal folks haven't like jumped completely on the bandwagon, but they're thinking about jumping 100% on the bandwagon. So <laughs> talk about them. Um, I guess coming back here, you know, it's worth saying that this is different from the MPO model, where there's like regional planning, but that's different from like authority over actually making the the laws, and it's also Interestingly, you know, the New York MTA sort of has, has a partial version of this model. You know, they have control over transit and some of the bridges, but not all of them. Um, but they don't have control over streets and parking uh, and bike ped infrastructure or anything like that. So, so they sort of have part of the model, and part of the model helps a little bit. They get some money from those bridge tolls to, to subsidize transit, but it doesn't help as much as if you really just give the full authority for transportation in the city to one one agency. And then the third thing that we, um, that we heard a lot about was governmental partnerships. 
Uh, so all of our case study agencies partner with other governments, local governments, regional governments to implement tax-based location value capture strategies you know, if they're doing that. Um, but one thing that we really thought was fascinating was that in New York and Washington, the partnerships occurred mostly when the local government or the taxpaying stakeholders championed the idea. So I already talked about how in DC, when, when they had the value capture um, success for you know, certain, um, certain pieces of transit infrastructure, that happened mostly because the business, business owners in those neighborhoods said, hey, we volunteer. We're going we're gonna to help out. Um, and that's, that's pretty different from the transit agency saying, how about you help out, you know, and starting that whole conversation. It was the business uh, owners that started that conversation. Uh, and in New York as well, the, the huge Hudson Yards development that I just talked about, there was, there was discussion at MTA about using the Hudson Yards land somehow to, um, uh, at, as, as, a, as a place that could be redeveloped. Um, but it wasn't until the city of New York came forward and said, we're going to create this, um, this financing structure and, you know, can we work with you and, like, make this happen. It was the city of New York that really pushed it. It wasn't the MTA. Um, but in our other case cities, the agencies in our interviews, they really came through as actively seeking to change the framework, um, the legal framework of taxation in specific ways so that... Um, using tax-based location value capture to fund transit became just the norm in their cities. I mean, there was our interviewee from London, for instance, said, um, you know, specifically said, yeah, we're trying to get the national government to devolve the, the business taxes um, that are paid currently to the to parliament, basically, to the national government, uh, down to the cities where they where the businesses are you know are located so that we have a lot more leeway to figure out how we're going to spend them not just on, on transportation on all kinds of things so they're actively thinking about it and advocating for it and trying to trying to change the the legal frameworks so just a few more photos so this is a this is a photo of that very large project in London the crossrail project it's a rendering of what it will look like so it's a construction photo um, it's an article about the enormous um, new rail project in Paris. The French capital has embarked on the most ambitious new subway project in the Western world. <laughs> um, uh, and, and this is an interesting one. So this is the transportation sustainability fee that has been recently approved in San Francisco about one year ago. Um, and, th and this was an interesting one because it's one of the only places where you really see a location value capture strategy levied on residential development. So this is why this one was pretty um, interesting, controversial, many years in the making, lots of advocacy, lots of lobbying that happened before they were able to implement this. Okay, so finally on to lessons learned. How can practitioners facilitate location-based funding for transit? So, um, so one... <laughs> One lesson is you never let a serious crisis go to waste, right? An acute funding or operational crisis was the catalyst for the institutional reform cases um, or location value implementation in five out of six of our case study cities. Um, and this is not a new finding. A lot of people have said crisis is really important for change, um, but it's important to, to, to say again, emphasize that this is one of the things we found. Crises definitely open windows of opportunity for a policy adoption. Um, Public support is important. Um, people have to, you know, there has to be value to be captured, which is usually associated with general support. Um, and it, there, there, there's this stuff about support for this specific mechanism being important. And that's really mostly about who are we taxing? How much are we trying to tax them? Has to be viewed as ec equitable. As I said before, it's much easier to tax businesses, developers, and motorists than it is to tax households. One of our interviewees from London commented, because they can't do residential taxation at all, he said, an Englishman's home is, in his, is his castle, right? Can't touch that. So that was the message there. And then lastly, agency mission is really critical. And this, this agency mission is very tied up with the institutional authority piece and the institutional reform that I was talking about. But what we heard, and I'll just, on the next few slides, I'm going to show some quotes from our interviews. 
Differences in mission really translate into differences in the ways that these agencies view opportunities. So in DC, our interviewee said, our space our spaces are used to move passengers, and we don't have a lot of excess space. And that was in response to, or in, as part of a discussion about, well, do you co lease commercial, lease a part of your station areas for commercial, you know, uses? We said, well, no, we don't have. And if you go to D.C., there's plenty of space, but it's true they don't lease. They don't lease this, the, those spaces for commercial. You don't see stores inside the, the the D.C. metro, even though, I mean, I thought, well, there is actually quite a bit of space in there. You probably could, <laughs> right? Um, Whereas in Montreal, you know, the, the, our interviewee commented, and this is paraphrased because the English wasn't as perfect, but he's like, you know, all transit agencies in Montreal are working to increase their non-fair revenue sources, and they aim to lease commercial spaces in their stations wherever it will be profitable to do so. So that's like a really fundamentally different point of view, right? Point of view about essentially the same thing. Another couple of quotes. So. Um, in DC, large-scale value capture is a very attractive yet very impossible way to generate funding. And that was, again, sort of thinking about, remember, they, they, in D.C., they have these, these very serious institutional kind of constraints. Um, uh, you know, whereas our, our interviewee from Transport for London says there was remarkably little fuss <laughs> about the use of value capture to finance London's Crossrail when they were getting, you know, 4.6 4 billion pounds or something like that from businesses. They were extracting this large amount of money from businesses, and there was remarkably little fuss about it. And um, our last set of quotes that in our interview from New York says, it's an ongoing struggle. Nobody wants to pay more taxes, and one-off value capture projects will never do it. And he was talking about you know, this realization that, yeah, we need you know, to, to do this for real. We need to do it as a you know, system-wide thing, much large scale. And these one-off value capture projects are nice, but they're not going to help our budget problem. And in San Francisco, our interviewee says, we're an experiment. Can you manage the right of way in a congested city? And like, we're going to try to do that, and we're going to try to do it the best we can, and we're going to try to, you know, figure out how we can be really creative about funding that effort. Um, and so this just uh, is, you know, re reaffirming that agency, agency authority is also important. That broader, broader authority and stronger intergovernmental partnerships. Um, give agencies more options. I think that's the main thing that they do. They give them more options. They allow for more cre creativity in developing these value capture funding packages. And that the, the mission and culture piece that I just talked about with those quotes um, can change most easily, I think, when, when the agencies do the institutional authority transformation. So I think that's kind of what happened. I think if I'd talked to the folks at um, London Transport back in the 90s, they would have sounded a lot like the Washington, D.C. and the New York folks did um, when I talked to them a couple years ago. So the biggest takeaway is that dramatic institutional change is a key enabler. And so that tells me kind of a couple things. One is that traditional, it may be true, I mean, it's a conjecture, but it seems like from these cases that our traditional North American European um, organizational characteristics of transit agencies are not particularly well suited to implementing these non-traditional and complex funding mechanisms. And perhaps that if agencies are seriously interested in this, they should also seriously consider um, whether uh, they have the authority or agency culture to make them happen or whether they can um, create that. And so here's whether they can create that. You know, major institutional change, this is the big finding here, that the major institutional change is difficult, but it, it's actually possible. I think that's a very promising um, and optimistic, uh, optimistic finding. And so I just want to thank, at the end here, to my collaborators, interviewees, and funders. So this was funded by um, the Volvo Research and Education Foundation. Um, and my co-authors on this are Elliot Sklar at Columbia University and Richard Barone at the Regional Plan Association in New York. Um, and I'll open it up for questions. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Joe Totten for the class, but also, uh, so Paris is overtaxation or possible overtaxation on there. Where exactly is the, um, is the, line running, if it's not running through Lana Falls, is it possible that they're trying to overtax so that they don't destroy their downtown or they don't have? It's not running downtown. So I didn't um, put up a map, but it's essentially like 
It, it connects to the current, you know, Paris Metro uh, and downtown area, but it's like these, it's a big figure eight around the region. And so it really, it, the idea is to expand in a big way how well the um, rail transit system really serves the suburbs. And part of it is this motivation, you know, you've probably heard in the news that over the last number of years that there's, there's a real kind of cultural, economic disconnect between people who live in central Paris and people who live in the suburbs, and it ca it's caused like social unrest and riots and <laughs> things, right? And so part of this is like, let's, let's bring them in, you know? <laughs> let's give them the kinds of infrastructure and services that we have in central Paris and make it one big region. So it's, it's really a, um, partly so socialist kind of um, um, goals in, in there. But yeah. Uh, yeah, Kelly. So, um, in San Francisco, do you see that um, Prop 13 limits their ability to do value capture, at least in terms of the property tax, and it sort of forced them to use this other creative mechanism, like looking at parking? That's a good question. You know, we didn't talk about Prop 13 at all in the interview with our San Francisco folks. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think property taxation is really hard to do. Most of these places are not doing direct property taxation unless it's through like a TIF kind of a um, mechanism. So I don't, my, my guess is that it probably doesn't matter too much because most places can't do property taxes taxation anyway. But I'm not sure because I didn't talk to them about it. Consequence of that is it's also a place now we're seeing hyper commuting where people have to move two hours out of the city um, in order to work uh, in South London. And so, uh, <coughs> so this sort of presents a double edged sword in some ways because if you're, you've got value capture, you have to be careful not to distort the cost even more mm -hmm. so that housing is a dead city for. On the other hand, building the transit also benefits those hyper commuters. Mm -hmm. And so in some way, the value capture could be levied on the other end of the line, right? The more suburban locations. Did they talk about this sort of problem that they have? They mostly talked about the fact that they couldn't levy property tax. <laughs> and so it kind of didn't matter. You know, that Englishman's home and is his castle concept, that they weren't going to be directly doing property tax. It was all about business tax and development tax and not straight up property tax. There's a few other people, yeah. Yeah, hi, my name is Ahmed, I'm a mechanical engineering uh, graduate student. Uh, all those big cities that you mentioned, London, San Francisco, New York, they are so big in tourism. <coughs> you didn't mention anything about, uh, is there like no. some kind of tax, you know, tax tourist tax? And, uh, That's a great question. Um, you know, it was a while since I, it, it certainly wasn't something that came up as like a really prominent piece of how they were doing this, but I can't be sure that there was none of it happening because I don't remember all the details. But it certainly wasn't raising a lot of money. Um, but there might have been at least one of these cities that had like a small tourism tax or something that, and, and it's a great idea, right? Why not do that? That's a great idea. If they're not doing it, they probably should. <laughs> um, yeah. This is curious about any of these cities in terms of attempting to capture land values in station areas, for example, did any of these cities change their LIP structure or any other legal structures to enable that kind of land-based value capture? Like what kind um, I'm not sure I totally understand. So, uh, LIPs collect both improvement value and land values. So, did any of the cities change their rules on LID not, or anything else to enable value capture of land? Not these. The, the places where I've read in you know, doing a literature review that, that there's been the separation of land and, and improvement value taxation is um, uh, in Pennsylvania. So there's been some efforts there, and, 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 but, I, but not necessarily to fund transit, but no. to fund all, you know, all kinds of things. Yeah, so I, no, yeah. Yeah. This is more just a general question. Um, in a city like LA, for example, is there a reason why they wouldn't um, expand their transit system more? Because I, I spent enough uh, more time there than I care to admit, and they have maybe 25% of the, 
the public transit that they need in terms of trains and stuff that takes you to point A and the point that you need to be is a 15-minute bus ride away. Is there a reason? Is it kind of a do you have lots of bureaucracy there? Lots of oh, what, what's wrong in LA is kind of your question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or like a city like Sao Paulo where they, you have tons of people, you know, they have kind of a Mickey Mouse replica symbolic transit system, but anywhere you go is going to be, you know, really far away from your ultimate destination. It's, it's yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm sure there are other people in this room that are more qualified than I am to answer your question. <laughs> So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna punt on that one. <laughs> yeah. I have a question that I think kind of piggybacks off of that, or is somewhat related to the Anderson and the transportation. Um, so my question is kind of about how, when you're trying to implement something like this in different cities, how the perception of like transit and ridership on transit influences whether or not it's successful. I feel like that might even tie into why it's successful in Asia, and maybe would be challenging in some cities that work here. Yeah, so that, that's sort of back to like the, the, the prerequisite for all of this is that uh, location value is created and is valued by, by voters and by the, by the population. Um, and so for sure, and, and, and in fact that's been a critique of, of, of the paper version of this that, that, that we've been circulating. Um, and you know, but we say, okay, sure, but maybe those places, um, you know, would have to use a more limited version of this model or no version if it's not really, you know, if your transit system is not creating location value, then you have a whole different problem, right? That, so, so this is about like in the places where transit is creating location value, um, how, you know, how can transit agencies think about structuring their funding, you know, plans to take advantage of that? So it's, it's a little bit more limited than, than trying to think about it doesn't really shed light on how to create location value. So that's a separate question. What about like outreach to the business owners on that? Like how do you gain support? Because I would imagine you don't get a ton of immediate like, yes, take more of my money. To go for well, yeah, so there, I do have an answer to that. So, there ha so some of these cities have actually done studies, right? And then, and then circulated them and their local chamber of commerce or their business community. So they've done, they've sponsored academic studies to say like this line you know, creates X number of dollars basically in um, in in commercial property values or in um, you know sale like likely to create you know a lot of new customers for you or whatever. So there've been different versions of it, but there have been these studies and and in fact that was a big part of in London their um, their business tax implementation. They had quote unquote remarkably little fuss about that, partially because they had first done this big study and circulated it widely among the business community in London saying your, your business will have a lot more value once we put this rail line in and most of the business community believed it you know and so that really helped build the constituency for you know the support for the policy. Yeah. Hi. The, yeah. I'm James. And, uh, are the Funds raised by location or value capture, are they typically just used to repay the initial costs or can they be applied long term to help reduce like fee, riders fees and operating costs? Operating yeah. Costs? Uh, so it depends, right? Um, most of, or a lot of the time, the fees, the, 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 the value capture mechanisms are structured to repay the capital cost, but there are, you know, some of the ongoing ones, like the payroll taxes and the um, and the motorist fees, so those those will often you know be meant to on in an ongoing sense offset whatever cost the, the system has, whether it's maintenance costs or operating costs or whatever. But yeah, so it depends on um, it depends on which mechanism is being used. I think somewhat. Yeah, Eric. Uh, I've got a question on my own. I got a couple from online. Uh, my question is: I haven't looked at the FTA scoring system recently, but do they award? Do they like projects that have some kind of value capture? That's sort of my question. From online, we've got a couple good ones. Um, what about failures of value capture? And then another one is: Does value capture affect the design of the system, perhaps the routing or station location? Right. So. Um 
Let me answer the two online questions first, and then I'm going to have to ask you to repeat yours. So, <laughs> so the so the 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 first um, so the question: What about what about failures? We heard about a few of those, or not outright failures, but like we brought in less money than expected kind of scenarios. Like for instance, the um, in London, the community infrastructure levy that had that pretty map and. Um, showing, you know, great gradient of how much they were charging developers in different areas. Um, that that actually brought in a lot less money than they expected because they implemented it concurrently with the with the real estate <laughs> crash, and so there wasn't very much development going on for a while in London. And and you know they expected eventually development. You know they they were saying well development is coming back and it'll come back come back in a bigger way in the future. But the timing of the money that's coming in is not going to be what we expected and so we're going to end up paying more interest and whatever on them. So they, so they did have some kind of failures to accurately predict how much money would be, be brought in and that was just one example and there are a couple of others um, that I, I think we, you know, that we heard about. So there are some and it's not usually a total you know, abject failure, it's more of a failure of like we thought it would bring in you know, X number of dollars and it actually brought in less than that. Right? Um, and then and then the other question was about, yeah, does it affect the design of the system? And that's a real concern, right? Like I, like I did talk about briefly about, well, we want to serve poor neighborhoods with transit if we can't do value, if it's not creating enough value in those neighborhoods, or if those, even if it creates a lot of value, the people in those neighborhoods can't pay. If you rely on this kind of mechanism to pay for transit, then maybe those projects would get de-emphasized. That's a major issue, right? And so. Um, so if you're implementing, you know, these kinds of mechanisms, it seems like you also have to think about that carefully and make sure that you have realistic expectations and not change your routing plan, you know, based on and your priorities necessarily based on how much money the different lines will bring in. You want to be serving, you know, rich and poor, right? And then the FDA about preference. So. I have no idea. <laughs> you looked into it. No. I'm sorry, I just wanted to make you knew. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I was curious about one of your beginning slides for the China fare rate compared to their operating cost compared to like every other location. Right. I was just curious on why China can do that. But why Hong Kong can do it? Yeah. yeah. So Hong Kong has a very, and, and actually mainland China, a bunch of cities do it too. They have a very different, um, well, they can do things there that we would consider unfair, <laughs> essentially. Um, and so what they do is they, um, the, the, the government owns the land and, and essentially gives out long-term leases to, um, to, to developers and, and, and who then develop the land. And so um, Essentially, like I don't remember the exact arrangement, but it's, there's basically this like arrangement where they get to buy the land at pre-development values, pre pre-transit values. So then they buy they buy the they buy low and they sell high, and it's constructed that way so that they can capture the value that they're creating. And we don't have a good way to engineer that kind of value capture here. So that's why, that's like, I mean, there are other things they do. They have a very efficient system. They're like, you know, world class in a whole lot of different ways. They do value capture in lots of different ways. But sort of the fundamental really big difference is that, that they can buy low and sell high on the adjacent land to their new rail systems, and that that ends up just like bringing in a ton of money, and we can't, we can't engineer that. Yeah. Usually, uh, the tax keys usually are used also to control the value of the properties. Uh, any of these housing agencies have made uh, any plans along with the, the housing policy rules or something like that? Like uh, a strategic plan, taxes, that probably capture the increase in value plan? A strategic plan, like. Um, you can also in the housing problem and the value of the property. In the city, so like like transit-oriented development, sort of thing, or yes, but also thinking in the public spaces that are made, also like a public investment, and then the increasing the value properties. There is an 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so value capture is something that is written about, about all kinds of public investments, right? Not just, not just transit. I'm, I just happen to be talking about transit, but you can read a whole book about it um, put out by the World Bank a couple years ago that has like one transit example and a whole book full of other, <laughs> other examples. Yeah, but then there are none of these agencies made like with an, I don't think so. You know, we didn't hear about that. So that's interesting. Like, did they did they also do some, you know, road investment at the same time or a park investment or whatever? I didn't hear about that. Not to say it didn't happen, but I didn't hear about it. I think we're out of time. All right. Thanks well, everyone. thanks so much.